Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marlon Reed, and I'm pastor here in Nashville, Tennessee at the Hillcrest Church. I'm excited to be with you tonight. I want to thank Pastor Josiah and Saba for the opportunity to share uh, the word of God with you tonight. You know, this has been quite a week, quite a year already, especially with all that's happening in America. And it is my hope that God will speak to us tonight and give us some encouragement as we navigate these difficult times. And so I just want to get right into the word. Um, I want to invite you to pray with me as we ask God's presence as we share together. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word to your people. Lord, we thank you for just the blessing of your grace in the midst of a difficult time. We invite you into our hearts. Give us clarity. Unite our hearts with yours. This is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Um, I believe, you know, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the term woke, of course. Um, it is believed the term woke was first used in the United States in the 1940s, and it was used to refer to, of course, being aware of issues concerning racial and social injustice. Well, this phrase kind of went dormant for some years, and then in 2012, it was resurrected, particularly when unarmed teen Trayvon Martin was shot dead in Florida by Neighborhood Watch volunteer George Zimmerman. The term was used heavily to raise awareness of the movement and was used to mean the expansion, it became expanded to mean to be being aware of the truth behind things the man is doing that you don't know. Well, the phrase has, the phrase has gained even more momentum in 2020 as we have all had to wrestle even more deeply with the repeated injustice. And here we are in 2021, and we see that nothing, not much has changed. And so as we begin this new year together, I want us to explore together what it means, just for a few moments, what it means to stay woke in the eyes of Jesus in a sermon simply entitled, Stay Woke. Uh, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles there to Matthew chapter 24, if you have your Bibles or your smartphones. And I just want to read a couple of verses for you. It says, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to, said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. Here Jesus makes a startling announcement about the coming destruction of Jerusalem, uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And his words are so alarming that immediately the disciples discern the profound implications of his words and deduce that he must mean that the world, that what he's saying must mean that the world is about to come to an end. Hence their question immediately following his statement what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The news of Jesus's announcement is deeply disturbing because of all what the Jewish temple represents. It is a symbol, as you know, of the perpetual presence of God. It is a symbol of national Jewish pride, a reminder of their status as God's chosen people. Jesus obliges them and he shares with them all of the things that will take place. He, he indulges them. He lays it out for them. All the things that will happen that will mark the sign of his coming. And all of the usual things he focuses on that we often emphasize when we are talking about the signs of the end of the world. You know, things like the emergence of false Christs and false prophets, widespread spiritual deception, wars and rumors of war, starvation and famine, unimaginable natural disasters, widespread disease and pandemics and religious persecution. He takes the time to point out though, I want us to notice not just the cataclysmic signs, but he points out what will be happening in the hearts of men and women that will also be a telltale sign of his coming. He says in verse 12 of Matthew 24 that there will be a growing sense of lovelessness. He says, a love that the love of many shall wax cold. And the word there, that phrase wax cold is the idea of the reduction in temperature 
by evaporation. In other words, love will be extinguished in the hearts of men at the end of time. This, he says, will, will be the result of the pervasive lawlessness in the world. This idea of illegality, the violation of the rule of law, attitude and behaviors that will exhibit a blatant and complete disregard for the not only the laws and the regulations of society, but the laws and the regula regulations of God. This descent into lawlessness, Paul in 2 Thessalonians tells us that it will be because there will be no love for the truth the closer we come to the end of time. In verse 11, he says, because of this lack of love of the truth, he says, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. As a result, Paul here is saying, because there will be no regard for the law of God, nor for the laws of man, it will be an age of alternative facts, an age of your truth and my truth and who said that is truth, no objective truth, not even professed believers and followers of God will govern themselves by an agreed rule of faith and practice. He says it will be an age of alternative facts. Just this week, we witnessed the devastating effects of the refusal to love the truth and to believe the truth. We saw that all across America, Paul says that says it best that the Lord gives those individuals who refuse to love the truth over to a strong delusion, meaning that those who disregard the truth literally lose the protective covering of the Holy Spirit that keeps them in their right minds. This week we saw on display, literally people out of their mind filled with nothing but hate for people who are of a democratic persuasion, people who are of another political persuasion to people of color. The acts we witnessed this week, many of them were committed while waving a flag with the name Jesus written on it. As if Jesus was somehow party and in support of their hatred and insurrection. This, my brothers and sisters, we see all of this happen because as a nation, 70 million people, I, should, I don't even know the exact number, but millions of people have refused to love the truth. We know from the Gospel of John that truth is not just uh, a presidential, the truth about the, the results of a presidential election. It's not just a list of beliefs or some really important things that we should follow, but we learn in the gospel of John that truth is a person. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we have to come to terms with the fact that the rejection of truth is not just the rejection of laws, of the laws of God, or the laws of society, but it is rejection of the truth that is that is a person. You see, my brothers and sisters, the, refu the refusal to love the truth is the refusal to love Jesus, who is the truth. And whenever this happens, it always leads to lovelessness and lawlessness. It doesn't matter how much you invoke Jesus's name, no matter how regularly you attend church, if you wave a flag with his name on it, if your love for God is not revealed in your love for your neighbor, those people who are a, of a different skin color and nationality from the other side of the tracks, from a low socioeconomic background who do not agree with you politically, if we only love the people who look like us and agree with our political and religious viewpoints, then we have to ask ourselves the question, who is the God that we're claiming to love? For the God that we say we follow, Jesus himself says, love your enemies, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, bless those who curse you. 
Jesus highlights, my brothers and sisters, in Matthew 24, the state of man's heart as a key indication that he is coming back just so that his disciples can stay woke. You see, he's trying to prepare them for what life will be without him. And he wants them to know how to live while they are waiting for him to return. And how, even more importantly than that, but how to accurately discern the times. But I want to make sure that we take note of an important observation. Jesus says that these signs are only the mark of the beginning of the time of the end. I don't want us to miss the significance of what is being implied with this statement. I don't want to us to miss another significant implied meaning pertaining to Jesus's prophecy concerning the temple of Jerusalem. And that is, hear me now, that Jesus wants his disciples to see the unreliability of the Jerusalem structure, a system of things that they have put their confidence in. So he talks about, he begins by talking about the destruction of the temple because he wants them to see how futile it is, how passing it is, how it's really just a man-made structure, a man-made system. The fact that the temple could be destroyed after so much time and effort had gone into rebuilding it revealed its fragility, its destructibility. You see, friends, Jesus is not just trying to educate them on the signs of the time. He wants them to come to a place where they no longer put their confidence in systems and institutions and structures. And we can't miss this lesson for us living in 2021. What we witnessed on Capitol Hill this week, many of us didn't even think that that could ever happen. It was unthinkable. And as we look back at everything that has happened in 2020 as well, I think that what Jesus is trying to get us to come to the place, he's trying to get us to come to a place where we no longer put our confidence in our institutions or in American democracy or in political savvy or jockeying, but in faith in him alone. I believe that Jesus has allowed everything that has happened in the last year and a half, all of these things to show us how quickly things can change in our world and how quickly democracy as we know it can crumble before our very eyes. And that the only thing that we can rely on, that the only thing that is constant in this world is him and him alone. But I want us to notice that Jesus doesn't just end his sermon there with the signs. He goes further and highlights an important lesson and a crucial revelation if we are to truly be woke. He says later in Matthew 24, and I'm going to read it starting in verse 35. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. Not even Jesus is aware when God is going to say it's time for you to come. But notice this, where I want to focus on. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the son of man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the son of man. Here Jesus describes, hear me now, that the coming of the end of the age as being just like in the days of Noah. Genesis 6 tells us that God was exceedingly sorrowful that he had made man. He regretted that he created man because the hearts of man was on evil continually. In other words, they were thinking about evil all the time. There was no limits to the imaginations or the the devisings of the wickedness that man would enact in the world. And so we see, just like in the times of Noah, today there is widespread and unimaginable, unspeakable evil. But there's another point that Jesus is making that he wants us to desperately see. And that is before the flood came, there was this corresponding normalcy. Everything went on as usual. 
People were getting married. They were drinking and eating. Things seemed normal. It was like any other day. People did what they always did. But then the rain came. And here Jesus reveals that a sign he's getting ready to come is that there will be a period of normalcy. Hear me now. Every day will seem like any other day. We will be attending weddings again, having Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners in our houses again with relatives. Donald Trump will no longer be the president. Everything will seem peaceful. Then he says the end will come. And Paul underscores this teaching in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. It is when everything seems normal that Jesus will burst through the skies. And after a year like 2021 and a week like this week, if we are honest, there is nothing more than what some of us want for things to get back to some kind of normalcy. Have normal political leaders again. Gather with friends again. Maybe we want to go back to church. And the normalcy we crave is all so that we can, it's our human nature, because we want to feel safe and secure. Go back in our comfort zone. But here Jesus lets us know that normalcy is actually the recipe for deception. It has a, a numbing effect on our spiritual senses. It lulls us to sleep about the reality of the times and the nearness of Jesus's coming. Because normalcy, peace and safety will characterize the end of the age, Jesus says in verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Watch, he says. The word therefore watch literally means to stay awake. And here Jesus is talking about a wokeness that is spiritual in its orientation. It has the idea of keeping an all night vigil. You see, if we are to be ready to meet Jesus and accurately discern the times, we must be more than woke against strategies, schemes, and the blatant injustices of man and the corrupt democracy of America. We must be spiritually awake. Jesus defines watchfulness or being woke in three ways in the parables that he uses to end his teachings to define what it means to watch. The first parable is the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. And you know the parable, the parable, uh, and then the parable of the talents, and then the parable of the sheep and the goats. Each contain an important lesson on what it means to be woke for real. The wise and foolish virgins reminds us that it is imperative that we have extra oil. It is a wokeness of heart, making sure that our hearts are, are, are filled with our Lord and Savior and filled with his life through the Holy Spirit. This requires a wholehearted and complete surrender. Only those who had extra oil were ready to meet the bridegroom when he came. Only those that took the time to surrender all to him and allow him in to completely, to completely fill their hearts. Only they were ready to meet the bridegroom. And so it will be with us being spiritually awake. We have to have a, a wokeness that is inward in orientation, that has a character that forms within us the character of Jesus Christ. But then he also describes another aspect of being awoke. And when he talks about the parable of the talents, which reminds us that every talent and gift that we have received is not for ourselves, is not to make our name great or to leave a legacy in this world. Every talent that Jesus has given us is so that is so is to be used for the expansion of his kingdom in the world. In other words, for men and women, boy and girl, to come to know Jesus. Jesus personally and experience the reign of God inside of our hearts and inside of their hearts. That's what our talents are for. It's for the expansion of the kingdom. And so not only must we not hide our talents in the ground, but we must use them only for his glory 
and not for ourselves. But then the, the final parable, the parable of the sheeting goats, reminds us of our need. Another aspect of being woke reminds us of our need to care for the less fortunate and the injustices in our world. Here Jesus reveals that caring for the injustice is not having a political agenda, but a human heart concern. You know the story. When, where, when did I? When did you visit me? When, when you, when you saw me sick? When you saw me in prison? Here Jesus is saying, caring for the souls of men and the injustices they suffer will need no television camera. It will need no political platform or any audience to truly have merit. The only audience that will matter, the only audience that it will be directed towards will be Christ himself. Caring for the injustice in our world is dealing with the injustices right before our very eyes, in our neighborhoods, in our neighbor next door, in our communities. Being awoke is having caring and deep compassion for injustice in our world. Being woke means we care for and we engage in the mending of the hearts of the lives of the hungry, the, dis the discriminated against, and the disenfranchised. Being woke means Jesus is the only real solution, understanding that Jesus is the only real solution and the ultimate answer to the sin problem. For 120 years, Noah faithfully builds the ark in faith, taking God at his word, believing a flood was coming and that it would destroy the world as well as that the ark he was building would be sufficient to say it took great faith to do what Noah. The act of building the ark took such great faith because in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, the writer suggests that it had never rained on earth before and that the earth had only been watered by a mist or a, like a morning dew. The rivers and the oceans had never before overflowed their banks. They had never experienced any disruption of the seasons or any violent or unfamiliar weather patterns. But Noah moved forward in faith. In the book, Redemption in Genesis, the author writes, he watched that Noah watched his children be born into the world, or he watched children be born into the world. He watched them grow up, get married, and have their own children, and their children grow up, get married, and have their children. And what the author is trying to get us to see, what, 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 what Jesus is trying to get us to see is that business carried on as usual, but Noah kept building the ark. Why? because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We normally define grace as just covering or uh, forgiveness for sin or the covering of our sin or the, the what's needed in order to grow and live victoriously. But here in Genesis, in Genesis 6, we see that when he says he found grace, it means that God found uh, uh, for no merit, uh, uh, for no cause for merit in Noah was that he found that he decided to reveal to him the reality of the coming judgment. It was his grace that opened Noah's eyes. And my brothers, it is grace that will open our eyes to the times. It is only the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. This, uh, 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 it is only the grace of Jesus will cause us to see the reality of the times and the reality that Jesus is coming again. I want to close with this story about um, Hurricane Camille that took place in 1969. It was one of the worst storms ever to make landfall in the United States of America. They had wind speeds of 190 miles per hour. And apparently Camille completely devastated the coast of Mississippi, taking 259 lives along the way. We'll never know how strong it was at its peak because it destroyed, it was so powerful that it destroyed all of the instruments that was used to record the speed of its winds. Despite the threat of hurricane the, 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 despite the threat that the Hurricane Camille posed, a group of residents on the Mississippi Gulf Coast refused to evacuate their homes. They decided instead to hold 
a hurricane party. Can you imagine? Though their apartment was only 250 feet from the water's edge and directly in the line of Egypt, they decided not to heed the warnings, but to have a party instead. They didn't really believe that the hurricane would come near them. They were in such peril that the local chief of police got wind of their planned festivities and paid the prospective partiers a visit. The tide was already rising and the winds were already beginning to pick up when he arrived at the apartment complex. Seeing a man on a second floor balcony with a drink in his hand, the chief yelled up to him, you need to clear out. The man replied, this is my property and you will have to arrest me to get me off of it. The chief tried to persuade others to leave but he had no success. And so as a last ditch effort to convey the danger they were taking on, he asked them for the names of their next of kin. He was trying to sober them up. He's like, let me, let me get your names because I'm gonna have to tell your family who you are. I have to confirm to them that you died in this hurricane. As they told him their names, they laughed him to scorn. And at 10, 10 15 PM, the front wall of the storm finally came ashore. Raindrops hit with the force of bullets and the incoming waves crested between 22 and 28 feet high. And when the storm was over, it was reported that the worst damage had occurred at the complex where the party of goers had refused the chief's warning. Nothing was left of the three story structure and the only survivor was a five year old boy clinging to a mattress. The people in the complex had an ample time to reach safety, but like the people of Noah's time, they ignored the warnings they received and they suffered the devastating consequences. My brothers and sisters, God has given us his word and his son, Jesus Christ, and it is all an act of grace. He has warned, he is warning us of the times. What we see happening in our world is to, uh, to awaken our attention of our need to start taking inventory of our lives. It is the grace of God in action that is trying to get our attention so that we can put our faith in him. Let's not ignore the warnings. His warning is an act of grace. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, just like that little boy clinging to the mattress, mattress, all you and I have to do to be awake spiritually is to hold on to Jesus for dear life. And when we do that, when he comes again, he will rescue us from this world. May God bless you as you begin the new year and may his grace cause us all to be awake spiritually. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for your word to us tonight. Give us humble hearts to receive it. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you will quicken our hearts, that you would make us alive to the reality of your coming. Show us how to live in the meantime. Show us how to care for the less fortunate by your grace. Show us how to use our talents for the building of your kingdom. And Lord, search our hearts today and see if there be any wicked way in us and lead us to the way everlasting. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, family. It's my prayer that God will continue to be with you and guide you through the new year.